Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you. Hello and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney, president of LPB. Joining me tonight to explore racial disparities in Louisiana is LPB's anchor, Natasha Williams. Welcome, Natasha. Well, thanks, Beth. Well, as COVID-19's pandemic spread in the state, we discovered the virus disproportionately affected African Americans. They were three times more likely to become infected than whites and twice as likely to die. And in the midst of the pandemic, George Floyd's death reignited debates about policing. And less than two months from the presidential election, analysts fear certain voting practices will discourage minority participation. Well, over the next hour, we'll examine those issues with panelists from the medical community, the criminal justice system, the ACLU, and others in a dialogue on disparity. We begin with comments from two members of the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force, Dr. Sandra Brown and Dr. Gary Wiltz. With COVID-19, we know that early on, we were at about 60% to 70% of the people who died from this virus were African Americans. And we also knew that those who did die from the virus had those comorbidities of hypertension, diabetes. More than half of the deaths from COVID-19 among African Americans, um, they had an existing condition of hypertension. So what the coronavirus did was just laid bare, I should say, our, our deep inequities that have, have been here for uh, decades. Uh, but Louisiana should be credited. We were one of the first ones and Governor uh, Edwards uh, appointed the Health Equity Task Force in response to the numbers that we saw where uh, African Americans were being infected at a higher rate. And, and one of the reasons that that may have happened was that a lot of uh, African Americans were in essential jobs, if you will, where they had direct exposure to the public more so than people that did not have those types of jobs. This task force is comprised of uh, subject matter experts. We have 18 members who serve on the executive committee of the task force. And then we have over 40 plus subcommittee members, um, subject matter experts. Uh, from across the state of Louisiana. We looked at this as an opportunity to not only look at health disparities in light of COVID-19, but to really be able to address those deep-rooted health inequities that have impacted Louisianians for decades. We had problems before COVID. I'm confident we will get through it. Uh, if people are given correct information and they know what to do, then I think for the most part, they will do it. Uh, but we have to be consistent and, and be patient, be prayerful, and, and uh, I'm confident we'll get through it and we can come out of this even stronger. Joining us remotely to discuss ways that we can move forward are three members of Louisiana's COVID-19 Equity Task Force. Dr. Sandra Brown is the Dean of Southern University's College of Nursing and co-chair of the task force. Dr. Keith C. Ferdinand is professor of medicine at Tulane University's Heart and Vascular Institute. And Dr. Reynold Verrett is president of Xavier University. And our first question, I'd like to start with Dr. Brown. What do you know about health inequities in Louisiana? What do we know about those health inequities? Thank you, thank you for having me and for allowing me to share this platform with Dr. Ferdinand and Dr. Verrett. According to the Louisiana Health Rankings Report, this is similar to a health report card. We know that Louisiana ranks 49th as one of the least healthiest states in the United States. Uh, we flip-flop with Mississippi. One year it's Louisiana, one year it's Mississippi. Uh, we also know that we also rank very low outcomes with cardiovascular disease, um, diabetes, and obesity. Um, but this health ranking is nothing new. Louisiana has held this health ranking for decades. 
uh, when we talk about equity, this means that everyone has the same equal opportunity to attain optimal health. When we talk about inequity, this means that for generations, people of color, particularly African Americans, have not had access to resources to obtain optimal health. And so because Louisiana ranks third in the nation as um, in its poverty ranking, the formula is a very simple formula. When you combine chronic health illnesses and low socioeconomic plus those barriers to achieving optimal health care, you're going to yield poor health outcomes and it's going to perpetuate the health inequities that exist in Louisiana. Dr. Verrett, we know that health disparities have existed long before COVID-19. What are some of the social determinants that create these disparities in the African-American community? Well, they are, they are very broad and also they're based upon a long history of how we perceive race. But we can begin with some, for example, we'll see that access to high quality food and nutrition, the fact that we have food deserts in many of our communities is an important factor as well. But also the fact that many of our you know, African-Americans are on the front line for this uh, pandemic, Many African Americans on the frontline employees are, are more likely to be exposed, and that we are more, very often more concerned about uh, protecting the client than, 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 than the employees who very often are black and brown. The, the other factors is housing. The fact that, that low quality housing for many African American communities, including high density living, which is also a factor in, in, in dissemination of the virus, there are many other factors. But also the perception of this patient population by our society, by our medical system, by many of our support structures is also a factor undermining how they are benefiting or being affected by this pandemic. Dr. Ferdinand, what would you say are the top health problems among African Americans in the state that puts them most at risk for COVID complications? And what advice would you give to them to protect themselves? When you look at a person who's been infected with the coronavirus, the disease is called COVID-19. And the outcomes appear to be worse related to, first of all, age. Older people do worse, but we can see it in younger persons. Diabetes, probably because diabetes inflames the vessels and COVID-19 can cause inflammation of the heart and vessels as much as it can inflammation of the lungs. Obesity, perhaps related to once a person has respiratory insufficiency, difficulty breathing, it's more difficult for them to get oxygen if they have extreme obesity. Hypertension, we're not really sure exactly how hypertension makes COVID-19 worse, but again, it may be related to the inflammation and the changes in the blood vessels. We have heard of younger persons in their 20s, 30s, and 40s who actually have a stroke with COVID-19. Of course, any sort of lung disease, chronic asthma, chronic lung disease, which will also make it more difficult to get oxygen and then finally, chronic kidney disease, probably again related to inflammation. And what can people do to try to avoid and live better lives when they have these conditions? One of the problems with the pandemic, as Dr. Brown and Dr. Red have already indicated, it did not cause these conditions. It revealed them. It's what's called a sentinel event. The Joint Commission looks at hospitals, and if you have doctors who are living in a dangerous manner in the hospital, patients are falling out of the bed, breaking their hips, then the Joint Commission will come and look at that hospital very scrupulously. Well, we already had sentinel events, increased hypertension, diabetes, obesity, chronic kidney disease, and then the coronavirus came in, COVID-19 was superimposed on top of these chronic conditions, and that's what causes the problem. I think to get to the root of the problem, first of all, wear your mask, safe, distancing, wash your hands. Secondly, if you have these chronic conditions, seek care to stay in home and not go to your doctor or not do virtual visits over the internet or the smartphone is not the way to go. It's important to control diabetes, eat a better, better healthy diet, control blood pressure, take medications, get refills, because then you won't have that soil where the coronavirus will implant itself and grow. Dr. Brown, what is the goal of the COVID-19 Health Task Force, and what are some of the measures they're taking to help equalize healthcare outcomes? Early on, we saw that the coronavirus had impacted African-Americans and people of color 
disproportionately to others. So the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force is comprised of subject matter experts from across the state of Louisiana, broad range, who bring a wealth of knowledge to the task force. Dr. Ferdinand is a member of our task force um, as well. So our charge was to provide recommendations to the governor, not only in light of COVID-19, but also how we could begin to address health inequities that exist in the state of Louisiana. We thought that this was a wonderful opportunity for us to make meaningful change, not only, as I said, in the light of COVID-19, but for decades to come. Um, some of the outcomes of the task force, we've looked at nine priority areas, and the governor has taken um, several of our recommendations. One, as it relates to testing, we wanted to make sure that anyone who wanted or needed to be tested could be tested. So we encourage the removing of barriers for to facilitate um, access to testing, particularly in vulnerable populations. Um, we spearheaded a communications and messaging. We wanted to make sure that the messenger was just as important as, as the message, that it was reliable, that it was relatable to the community that it was targeting, and that public health is built on public trust. So we wanted to make sure that we produce trustworthy communications and messaging. Um, we had a committee look at, at the data and where were the gaps uh, in the data. A health equity dashboard is going to be generated from the subcommittee. We also address vulnerable populations, our prisons and our nursing homes, to make sure that the state was doing what it was obliged to do for those congregate settings. Uh, policy and regulatory affairs is going to be looking at what type of legislation we can move forward that's going to help promote health equity. And then we have a community outreach uh, subcommittee that is um, at the grassroots level of what communities and what zip codes should we be targeting. And lastly, we have a committee looking at racial disparities and health provider biases in the um, patient populations that they serve. Dr. Verrett, I understand that you're participating in some vaccine trials related to COVID. Explain why some members of the minority communities have a mistrust of medical research and why you encourage them to get involved. The issue of trust, as Dr. Brown mentioned, was the reason why uh, myself and my, and my colleague, the President Dillard, both joined the trial. We knew that they were, we had heard that there were very few African Americans involved in the Pfizer trial, which began here and other trials as well. So we wanted to give the example by rolling up our sleeves to African-American men who did so. But the trust issue is longstanding. It has to do with many factors, not, not only one. We all heard the syphilis of the syphilis study at Tuskegee. Mm -hmm. uh, that is one example of, of Henrietta Lacks, of the donor of the HeLa cell line. But we have had many examples. But the larger issue also is that the face of American medicine tends to have very few African-Americans in that face. So there is, there's historic mistrust that, 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 that is coming to us. The only answer today is real transparency. We're seeing some transparency in the clinical trials right now, but greater transparency is very important to show, for example, who's behind in, uh, the trials, who are in, 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 the, uh, in, in the committees evaluating the trials to make sure that people see that they are practitioners and providers of, of color at, at the table making important decisions. That will be important to do because if we don't do that, when the vaccines are, are, are available, many people will not want to avail themselves of the vaccines and the communities that are most suffering the greatest impact of COVID-19 are communities that are black and brown. Dr. Ferdinand, your research includes health disparities. What policy changes would you like to see at the state and national levels to help combat health inequities? When you look at some of the reasons behind health disparities, it's probably not really genetics. African-Americans, as you know, are a mixed population it's related to what's called the social determinants of health. And that's what we started with, and that's probably where we should end. Access to health care, an identifiable source of primary care, that means you have a doctor, nurse practitioner, or physician's assistant, getting referral to specialists when needed, and the appropriate use of evidence-based medicines. That means medicines that have been proven to be effective, not just feel-good drugs, but things that actually help people live better. If we apply that, equally across the population, it will go a long way towards reducing these disparities. But it's not being equally applied. We now know that the white-black death gap nationally has been persistent for decades. Black men have the shortest life expectancy. 
black women live shorter than white women. And it's not, again, because of genetics. It's because of these social determinants of health. So we need to address those. We need to have specific targeted programs. And I'm very happy to be part of the task force under the leadership of Dr. Brown and, and Dr. Lavise. What they have been doing is making sure that we hone down on those issues that we can address. Dr. Verrett, as president of an HPCU with a pharmacy program, how is Xavier training students to tackle health inequities? Well, we have, uh, we, we educate them about, uh, not only about the disparities, but also the roots of those disparities. We have a Center for Health Disparities at Xavier, which is a multidisciplinary effort that, 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 that incorporates at, uh, partners nationally and, and, and has uh, sessions here at, in New Orleans. But also we have had programs where we are making sure that new programs that come in, the, in, our, health, in our health professions uh, address the lack of providers of color. For example, our school of pharmacy provides one of the largest pools of, of, of black pharmacists in, in, in the nations. We have established a physician assistance program uh, where we know the discipline of physician assistance has presently somewhere around in the single digits, three to five percent of, of practitioners are practitioners of color. So there's a need for more, more practitioners that look like you and me. There are also, well, what we are looking at is also increasing the physician assistance in the state of Louisiana by almost 50 percent. That's significant. We are making sure the practitioners are present, that those practitioners also can think critically about the larger issues that are not just purely technical. They are also thinking about the societal issues that impact how patients respond and, are, and, and have access to care. Thank you very much. That's all the time we have for this segment. Thank you, Dr. Brown, President Verrett, and Dr. Ferdinand for your input on overcoming Louisiana's health disparities. This summer, the death of George Floyd and police shootings, including one in Lafayette, have triggered protests and even riots across the country. We reached out to Nora Ahmed, legal director of the ACLU Louisiana, and Deputy Chief Daryl Basco of the Fraternal Order of Police for their thoughts on criminal justice in Louisiana. If Louisiana itself were a country, we would have the highest incarceration rate in the world. Black boys and men aged 15 to 24 are five times more likely to be jailed following arrest than white boys and men of the same age. So what we know in parallel is that Louisiana has more police officers to residents than any other state in the country. And what we found was that the majority of people killed by police in Louisiana over the last six and a half years were black men shot by officers. We need to start thinking about how do we change the conduct of police officers. And right now, the litigation system is such that when a judgment is in place against a police officer or a police department for an unconstitutional violation, it's the taxpayers that are paying for that unconstitutional violation. I think you have disparities between law enforcement and understanding from both sides um, within different communities. I think one of the biggest problems that we're looking at today is with social media, there is so much rhetoric coming from both sides of the, of the, the disagreement. It starts to cloud actually what the facts are on our issues that we're having. As much as it's human nature, I think, to want to prejudge or want to make a determination, uh, that's what the legal process is in the United States. I think that compliance from the public and de-escalation techniques by law enforcement officers are hand in hand. We, and I'm talking about law enforcement, I'm talking about the general public, we are wanting perfection in a system, in a criminal justice system that the problem involves humans. We're not perfect on both sides, so we have to be able to work together to achieve and get the system as close to perfection as we can. Joining us to discuss criminal justice disparities are two panelists here in the studio. State Senator Cleo Fields is a Democrat from Baton Rouge. He introduced a resolution in 2020 to create the Police Training, Screening and De-Escalation Task Force, which he now chairs. Lauren Lampert is executive director of the Louisiana District Attorneys Association and former police chief in Alexandria. And joining us remotely is Alana odoms Abair, executive director of the ACLU of Louisiana and Deputy Chief Daryl Basco with the Pineville Police Department and head of the Louisiana Fraternal Order of Police.
I'd like to start with you, Ms. Abair. What does the ACLU see as areas in Louisiana's justice system that disproportionately affects communities of color? Thank you so much for having me. Racial bias impacts every aspect of our criminal legal system. When you look at pretrial incarceration, you are looking at statistics that African-American men and boys are more than twice as likely to be incarcerated than their white male counterparts. You're also looking at statistics that involve uh, members of the community who are victimized by police brutality. And while African-American people make up only 32% of the population, they are 54% of the people who are involved uh, in officer-involved killings. And that is a stark and shocking statistic. Uh, we also see things that are very minor, like marijuana um, possession and the charges that people encounter for that. And, and African-American people are three times as likely to be charged with marijuana usage and possession. And while we know that drug usage is pretty much equivalent and equal between all races. And so you see a system that is largely defined by race and also a system that's largely defined by wealth, which means that you're much more likely to be uh, considered innocent if you are white and if you are wealthy than if you are an African-American person and if you are a person who is of low socioeconomic means. And when we have a system that is defined by both race and wealth, you have a system that is incredibly unsafe and that does not keep any Louisianian safe. Thank you. Um, Senator Fields, can you tell us about the task force you created and some of the recommendations that you're considering? Well, the task force was uh, created uh, this past session, regular session of the legislature, um, or the special session, actually. And the purpose of it is to, to, um, to deal with um, the problems that we have across the country, quite frankly. Uh, we divided the uh, task force into uh, four different subsections. Uh, one, training. Training is very important. We got to deal with the root of the problem. You know, there are a lot of officers who go to work every day and do the right thing. Uh, but there's, there's a few. There are a few that, that do not do the right thing. And so training is so important. Um, second, we have uh, funding. We need to look at the resources that we have today and see if we need to improve them uh, or see if we need to shift them from one place to the other. Uh, third, policy. You know, uh, policy is so important. There are a lot of policy changes that we're going to have to make uniform, in my view. You know, I, I think uh, every police officer uh, should have a video camera, a uh, body camera, and I think that camera should go on immediately whenever they deal with the public. There has to be technology in this country that where when they exit their vehicle, it automatically uh, turns on, whereby they don't have the option to turn it on and off. Uh, do we want to have a uniform uh, policy as relates to chokeholds? Why should we have chokeholds? Those issues are being de debated now in subcommittee. Um, there are a host of issues that we're going to have to deal with, and I, what I would like to see accomplished at the end of the day, and that is that we have a uniform policy that every police department across the country, I mean across the state, will use, uh, and there be no deviations from it. Thank you. I'd like now to go to Chief Deputy Basco. I'd like your opinion on some of the task force recommendations. But first, could you clarify whether there is a standardized training for police across Louisiana, or does it vary from department to department? Well, thank you for having me. Um, sure. In Louisiana, there are minimum standards that all police officers have to adhere to. Uh, whenever someone's hired as a police officer, there's a certain curriculum that is set forward about uh, with post standards and a minimum amount of hours and within that curriculum of the different subject matters that they have to uh, study. Then also post or the police officers standard training council has required 20 hours of in-service training at a minimum per year uh, in the state of Louisiana. So there is some uniformity uh, for academy training, there is some uniformity because those topics are specialized uh, each year as they come through. Uh, but as anything, uh, like the senator said, a big part of this uh, key is funding and, and what funding is available for agencies to be able to give their officers more advanced training than a different agency. So in your opinion, Senator 
feels as recommendations, do you agree with using them, implementing them? How would you go about that? Well, I think it's a little bit too early to decide exactly which recommendations are uh, are going to take hold within the task force. We're in our infancy stage, I would still say, I think we've had about three or four meetings over the past month. We've still got a long way to go to the next session. And right now we're hearing testimony from the general public, from subject matter experts, uh, to figure out exactly what we're going to be able to achieve with some of the uh, reforms and propositions that are being made to us. Could we talk about body cams? Um, they are a point of contention all across the country, um, someone being able to turn them off, the use of them, some places not having them. What is your uh, opinion? What is your feeling on body cams overall? So I, I don't feel that any officer is objecting to, uh, to body cams. Uh, that's an agency decision of what policy they're going to implement that is either going to be based within, depending upon your form of government, the mayor, the metro council, uh, the police chief. Uh, the problem that you hear from so many agencies about body cameras is that you have not only the cost of the initial purchase of the body camera, but you have the cost of the, of the storage and, and the longevity of that storage. You know, uh, whenever you start compounding of keeping videos on an arrest or just any interaction uh, with the public between the public and a police officer, and you have to worry about making those that uh, documented storage, whether it's in the cloud somewhere or whether it's internal, that equates to dollars uh, in the long term. And that's one of the things that we hear on our side uh, from the Fraternal Order of Police is that a lot of agencies are saying that we're being strapped because of COVID or other reasons. Our tax base are down or, or, or tax monies are going in other directions. So they have to be more frugal with their money and, and the funds that are available to them to be able to use uh, and purchase body cameras for the long term storage. Um, Mr. Lampert, Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden has proposed the elimination of cash bail and says it's disproportionately affecting minorities. As a district attorney, could you explain what that means and give us your thoughts on his idea? Thank you, Natasha, and, and thank you for having us here. Uh, you know, the eliminating cash bail is kind of the hue and cry. The devil is in the details. Uh, you know, district attorneys generally have no stake in how somebody is released. Um, our issue is typically whether they're released. And, and generally across the state, the district attorney's position has been, if somebody is neither a danger to the community and they are likely to reappear for court, we don't see a reason for keeping them. But if they are a danger to the community or they're not likely to appear for their court uh, dates, then we don't care how much money they have or don't have, they should be detained. Um, you know, our when you eliminate cash bail, in Louisiana we have several ways that, that bail is, is, uh, is authorized. Two of those are a cash deposit or a surety where they buy kind of an insurance policy or a bond. I think that's what uh, uh, Vice President Biden is speaking of and, and many others when they say that. Um, the, in order to do that, you have to replace it with something. And, and what many jurisdictions have replaced that with or attempted to replace it with or a risk assessment tool that kind of evaluates those things we talked about, whether they're going to show up and what a danger they are. We have very much a risk assessment tool in, codified in Louisiana with Article 316. Um, and, and in the few places we've seen the risk assessment tool rolled out, the vast majority of them have seen a negative impact on public safety. Um, and, and I know New Orleans has had a risk assessment tool in place for a while. Um, I think if you read the Metropolitan Crime Commission's report on an evaluation of that assessment tool, at least at the time it was written, there's some serious problems with that tool as it's being applied right now. Thank you. Ms. Abair. in some recent police shootings, such as in Jacob Blake's in Wisconsin, it appears in the video that the suspect uh, fails to comply with police officers' demands before getting shot. Now, what duty do citizens have when an encounter happens with police to de-escalate that situation? Yeah, thanks for that question. And I think, let's be clear, we as citizens have the responsibility to uh, behave lawfully. Um, but police officers, with their training uh, and 
the special um, education that they receive have a heightened duty to be able to interact with the public in a safe way and to serve the community and to de-escalate situations. One of the things that I think is most troubling about police officer interactions with citizenry is that many times you see, for example, uh, as in the case in Louisiana with Trayford Pellerin, an individual who is experiencing some kind of mental health crises. And as we know, in the case of Mr. Pellerin, um, uh, instead of receiving care and concern from police officers, he was met with bullets. And I think what you're seeing across the nation is in instances where police officers are responding to cases where individuals are in crises, mental health or otherwise, the police officers are not equipped to be able to de-escalate those kinds of situations. And while there may be some uses of force that are required in cases where individuals present a risk or threat to the community, more often than not, there are less than lethal ways to interact with community members. And unfortunately, we just don't see officers exercising those de-escalation tactics. And so what I think we need to do is we have to get to the heart of why black people are considered to be more dangerous than any other group. If we don't do that, I think we're going to, con con we're going to continue to see the kind of excessive force and violence used against black people that we continue to see today. Chief Deputy Basco, one of the ideas that has been received a lot of attention is the national on the national level is to hold bad police officers accountable to abolish qualified immunity. Can you explain what that is and your thoughts on this proposal? Uh, qualified immunity sets a, a, a legal precedent standard uh, that was handed down by the United Supreme United States Supreme Court, like many other cases. Of, of jurisprudence that's there that sets some standards that says as long as a police officer is acting in good faith and within the realm of training and, and the things that they're supposed to be doing legally, then they have a protection or qualified immunity against doing their job. Being a police officer is not a cookie cutter response. You're going to deal with different people at different times in their lives uh, with different issues that are going on. And I can't treat or an officer can't treat person A the same as you're gonna treat person B. So the, the qualified immunity doctrine gives us the, the leeway and the protection uh, for us to be able to engage with people. And as long as we're doing everything correctly, then it gives us some protection. You know, in the past couple of years, all the cases that have come in from the United States Supreme Court that have questioned qualified immunity, uh, they, they have been decided either a nine to zero or, a, or an eight to one count uh, that's there with qualified immunity. So it's not a it's not a political spectrum idea. It's something that the justices on the current Supreme Court are even nine to zero or eight to one uh, counting uh, looking at. But I think when the discussion about these national um, to eliminate it, the discussion talks about the fact that even with having cameras, even with having video, um, oftentimes the officers basically get off with a camera present um, despite everything that it would appear that the officer is basically wrong. Body-worn camera video is a piece of evidence. Uh, you have to use all different parts of the piece of evidence to put a criminal case together or, or some type of a case to figure out how it's going to work. Uh, a body camera from a certain point of view may not tell uh, you know, a, a, the story in the same way that somebody shooting a cell phone video from a different vantage point uh, it, it is going to look at. So you have to be able to take video, DNA, uh, witness testimony, uh, eyewitness statements, any of that stuff, and put them together in order to look, use all of those components to make a determination. Qualified immunity is, in fact, a jurisprudential doctrine. Uh, that was created by the United States Supreme Court, but it actually does state that an officer can violate the constitutional rights of a citizen and still not be held liable if that right is not clearly established under law. We're really in a catch-22 situation where the court is looking backward to see if any other court 
has held an individual responsible. And if they have not, then the individual in the current circumstance is not held accountable. And that really just creates a system of a lack of accountability for officers. Mr. Lampert, do we have any indication of the effectiveness of body camera usage in Louisiana in documenting or curtailing actually police misconduct? Can I answer that from two ways? I, as you know, I was chief of police in a moderate sized department, around 200 officers for a number of years, and I in, implemented a body camera policy. And, and we bought the cameras and we had a supportive, not only the, the police union, um, all the stakeholders came together and thought it was a great idea. As a prosecutor, I can tell you that, that it is often valuable, but it's not the panacea and it's not the only thing that prosecutors will or should look at whenever they're putting a case together. Another unintended consequence of proliferation of body cameras around our state is that prosecutors screening cases n now take exponentially uh, longer than they did before. We're deluged with uh, huge amounts of data to assess and we have to assess every bit of that that evidence because there might be Brady information in there that we're compelled to turn over to the other side. So it's added a lot of of, uh, of work load to both sides of the equation as well as cost. Senator Fields, if you could wave a magic wand and make three immediate changes to police enforcement, what would you do? Wow, that's a good question. I may wave that magic wand. One, um, you know, as I st stated earlier, body cams, I mean, I don't think it should be an option in Louisiana as to whether or not law enforcement officers wear body cameras. And I do understand the, uh, the costs associated with it, and that's one of the uh, functions of the task force is not only to uh, make policy, but also uh, fund it. Uh, so one would be uh, every officer, every peace officer in the state, every peace officer in the state uh, have a body camera and not have the option of turning it on and off when they interface with the public, one. Two, uh, every officer would go through DS, I mean, uh, 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 psychological evaluation before they become a police officer and uh, throughout their career as a peace officer. And particularly when there is an incident where use of force was, uh, was uh, when there was a use of force incident. Uh, I think that's, that's important not only for, you know, the general public. Uh, I, I really think it's important that officers who have you know, been traumatized with using their weapon, for example, they really need to have, just like we do when something happens at a school, kids go through, you know, have psychological uh, uh, folk on, on, on staff or at the school to, to assist them. Same thing with our police department. Third thing, um, look, I, I really don't think it should be an option, uh, and there are some who disagree with me, uh, but, you know, law enforcement officers, uh, you know, if, you know, if that camera information is available, it should be, uh, I mean, it should be made available to the public. I think all camera video should be made available to the public immediately. I don't think there should be any question as to whether or not there's an investigation. I think people want transparency, and I think there needs to be a uniform law, uh, a state law that provides that once that footage is, is, uh, is taken, Okay. Uh, that footage should be made available to the public. Thank you. That's my magic wand. <laughs> now, will it happen? I don't know, but that's my magic wand. Okay. Well, that's all the time we have for this segment. Thanks very much to Senator Fields, Mr. Lampert, Ms. Abair, and Deputy Chief Basco for contributing to our discussion on criminal justice disparities. In less than two months, voters will be deciding America's next president and many congressional seats. The coronavirus pandemic has altered how Louisiana voters cast their ballots in the primary election. The proposed emergency plan for November has been challenged in federal court. We spoke briefly with ULM political science professor Joshua Stockley and political analyst John Cuvion to obstacles to voting past and present. Half of all eligible voters that did not vote in the last federal election cycle cited external barriers to voting. And that number goes up when you look at Blacks, Hispanics, elderly, disabled, and low-income voters. Some of the biggest external barriers are decreased polling locations, reduced polling hours, voter registration laws, and voter ID requirements. 
Louisiana is one of only seven states in the nation that is not making an exception for COVID and mail-in voting. The emergency voting plan was accepted by both houses of the state legislature. However, it was rejected by Governor Edwards. The plan also now finds its way in court Federal Court Judge Shelley Dick ruled last week to allow more access to absentee mail ballots for the November 3rd presidential election. Secretary of State Kyle Ardua has not decided if he will appeal. Either way, Kuvion says the election is shaping up to be one of the state's busiest. Sherry Hadsky, who works for the Secretary of State's office, in court testimony, she had stated that 158,000 Louisianians had already requested a mail-in ballot. And that is significant because it is two and a half times the volume of those who voted by mail in the 2016 presidential election. The volume is staggering, and that alone will put a strain on the Secretary of State and or the various parish registrars of voters. We're starting to get into the danger zone, so to speak, in terms of really needing to have a decision quickly because of the various steps that have to be taken at both the state and parish level to ensure a functioning election. Well, joining me to explore the challenges to voting that COVID-19 has exacerbated, Dr. Albert Samuels, the chair of the political science department and history at Southern University. State Senator Barry Milligan is a Republican who represents District 38 in Shreveport and co-chairs the Senate and Governmental Affairs Committee. And joining us remotely again is Alana odoms Bear with the ACLU of Louisiana. I'd like to start with you, Ms. Bear. We heard from Dr. Stockley about some of the obstacles to voting that primarily affects minorities. Do you feel that voter suppression is currently taking place in Louisiana? So we'll say that any plan that doesn't allow for no excuse absentee voting in the time of a pandemic is one that uh, directly impacts incredibly vulnerable communities. Uh, those communities include African Americans, uh, those who are more um, likely to be subject to coronavirus infection, and those individuals who are elderly or even caring for someone uh, who is, is elderly. Um, we are encouraged by the federal court's recent ruling, which would uh, establish, again, some additional time for early voting and um, really increase people's access to the ballot. Um, while we know that voter suppression is real, we can fight back. And what we need to know is that we need to get registered to vote. We need to have a plan for voting, and then we need to go ahead and cast our ballot. And I wanna share some really important deadlines for people to remember. First, your deadline to register to vote is October 13th. Your deadline to register and request an absentee ballot is October 30th. And your early voting deadlines are October 16th through October 27th, and that excludes Sundays. Uh, Dr. Samuels, could you explain for us the Secretary of State's emergency plan for the November election, why it was challenged in federal court, and what the decision was? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh Essentially, essentially what the Secretary of State's plan did, and first of all, thank you for inviting me here, but, but essentially what was the plan was that it actually, essentially, it, 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 it basically restricted the ability of people to request absentee ballots, absentee ballots. And one of the reasons that it was challenged was that particularly in the light of the pandemic, where you have people who have concerns about getting out and uh, people have comor comorbidities and those who are, are caretakers for those who are in those categories that the, that the plan put forward did not provide in enough protections for them. And so that's essentially what, this, what the, uh, the, the, the judge essentially agreed with a lot of the, the plaintiffs and expanded the, expanded the days for early voting. Now, it's still uh, hasn't been determined whether or not the Secretary of State is going to appeal that ruling. But uh, like I said, we're getting very close to Election Day, and so some resolution needs to, needs to happen because essentially the election in many ways is already kind of in progress. Well, Senator Milligan, you voted to support Secretary Ardois' emergency plan. What are your reasons for doing that? Well, I'll tell you that, that it was a committee decision, obviously, to bring it to the legislature for a vote. 
the legislator vo legislature voted for the plan. You have to remember that in the original emergency election plan for the July and August elections, we were in a stay at home uh, order. We were not in phase one. We had no idea what we were looking at. And right, so we ex helped expand to allow more people to vote under the, the COVID crisis. We're currently not there. We're, we're not there anymore. We're in a new place. We're, we're in phase three. The numbers are looking good. You have to remember that under the current law, election law, if you're 65 and older, you can vote. If you're hospitalized, you can vote. If you're going to be out of town, you can vote. We, we added the provision that says if, if you uh, um, are, are COVID positive or you're hospitalized with COVID, you obviously can vote. We, we felt like that was appropriate for the time that we're in. The other aspect of that, though, is the emergency election plan not only did it deal with making sure um, we protect the sanctity of our elections, it was allowing more time for early vote, but more time for the processing of those ballots. Because we know that there's been situations, uh, in, for instance, in, in New Orleans itself in the July election, where there were 4,000 ballot requests that sat in a, in a postal service warehouse that were found and processed, but they had to be processed emergency to get them out. We know that Wisconsin, after the fact, found tubs of, of completed ballots that had been processed. And so we, we want to protect that. And we felt like the emergency plan, you know, if, if you're able to put on a mask and go to the store, you're able to go to school, we felt like the polling locations were safe. They're certainly sanitized. You certainly can take care of social distancing. Um, we felt like that that's really the safest place. And, and the best place to vote is always in person, obviously, if you, if you can. You know, in the last election in July, 81% uh, of the people voted in, in person. And not a single COVID case was reported from that. And so the plan was developed. Uh, Secretary Arduin developed the plan, came to us. We felt like it was fitting of the time. And so that's why we, we voted for it. So do you feel the Secretary of State should appeal the ruling? You know, I can't speak on behalf of the, the Secretary of State. I feel like it's up to him and the Attorney General to decide uh, which direction to go with the, with the ruling. Um, the thing that we have to worry about with the judge's order as it stands now is it actually shortens the processing time for those ballots. And obviously, as we've just heard, that's a real risk, right? If you've got more people voting absentee, because obviously this is a more important election than July and, and August, you've got 150,000, I think the number was, was quoted, you need more processing time. The judge's order doesn't do that. The original emergency plan not only did it address COVID, but it addressed that processing time to make sure the election is counted and counted accurately. I don't know what he's going to do. Um, we're not in on that discussion, though. Ms. Abair, a law approved by Governor John Bell Edwards in 2018 restored the voting rights to some felons last year. What are the particulars of this measure and what needs to be done to make sure these folks register for the upcoming election? Yes, so there are some provisions under our current law that allow people who have convictions for felonies to vote. And so it's important for everyone to know that uh, you can still vote if you have been convicted of a felony. If you are on probation, uh, you can still vote. And if you've been off of parole for more than five years, you can vote. I think the most important thing for people to know is that if they have confusion about this, they should go and they should seek a letter of eligibility from the Office of Probation and Parole. That's the first line of communication. And then they can take that letter to the Office of the Voter Registration and they can um, make sure that that documentation is submitted. I think the most important thing for everyone to understand is that voting is a fundamental right and that having been convicted of a felony does not remove that right so long as you are in compliance with the requirements of the law. So if you want to make sure that you are in compliance, again, you can check in with probation and parole, uh, get that eligibility letter, and then get that eligibility letter filed so that you can exercise your right to vote. Dr. Samuels, in 2001, redistricting, redistricting will take place. Explain the potential that exists for disenfranchising voters in this process. Well, I think, I think we've got to be careful here. And when we, when we think about redistricting, uh, probably what's one of the things that's probably more at issue in redistricting uh, 
on one level is not so much uh, disenfranchisement in the sense of denying people the right to vote in, in, in some instances, Chairman. so much as it is in how we draw districts, mm -hmm. how, we, uh, how, we, how we draw districts. Uh, the redistricting process is probably, there's hardly a process that is more political than redistricting because largely it involves politicians drawing lines that in many cases they have a vested interest in. Uh, and so how you draw those lines uh, can ha has implications. And now, especially now in, in an age of technology where we actually have the ability to do far more sophisticated mapping. So the potential for politically motivated gerrymandering right, right now uh, uh, goes exponentially up. I, I will say that one concern ab uh, also relating to the issue uh, of, of gerrymandering, uh, I'm not sorry, not gerrymandering, but also redistricting, is the census. Mm -hmm. The census that is, is very important for Louisiana residents to be counted. Right now, I think right now we have one of the lowest uh, reporting rates now with the census, and time is running out for people to participate in the census. And keep in mind, this is a very simple process. Uh, it, it, filling out takes less than five minutes. Uh, so if you have not participated in the census, it's very important that you are counted uh, because it has implications for federal dollars in Louisiana. And those are the numbers that are going to be used by people like you in a year to help draw those districts and be the baseline. So it's very important for citizens to participate in the census. Uh, Senator Milligan, the Governmental Affairs Committee that you co-chair is significant in the redistricting process. What will be your philosophy going into this process? Well, I'll tell you, and in, in, in first of all, with, with Senate and Governmental, um, I'm fortunate to, to, to uh, be vice chairman of the committee behind a, a, a fabulous chairwoman, uh, Senator Sharon Hewitt, and she's a leader in, in the committee and obviously when it comes to redistricting. Um, you know, the big thing with that is, and, and I most agree, we've got to make sure we get our census numbers. I think the last time I looked, we were at 64% or somewhere in there. It was really, really low. And that's a scary thing because our federal dollars is obviously based on that. Mm -hmm. But the whole process is a legislative act. Um, it will be my first to go through. And so it's a legislative act that we all intend to work together and buy in. M my goal with redistricting is it's done fair and balanced but it's also done transparent. You know, we are elected to represent our constituents back home. In my mind, we are elected to represent all Louisianians and we've got to work together on the redistricting process. We are currently uh, in policy workshops and, and, and studying to make sure, and obviously looking at the latest technology, as was mentioned, to make sure that we get it right. It's, it's going to be a year-long process. We've already started looking at it, obviously COVID and, and these special sessions kind of get in the way. But it's certainly going to happen during uh, 2021, and, and we intend for it to be done very fairly. Well, there have been concerns voiced by Democrats fueled by President Trump that he and his postmaster general are politicizing the Postal Service to control the election. How do you respond to those types of charges? You know, I don't know. I, I obviously can't speak for the president, and, and so much of the news that we hear is sensationalized. I know that from the, from the president's standpoint, and this was under President Obama and President Trump, the post office was always under scrutiny. They, they, they bleed red ink. And so there was always a move to streamline them, make them, more, uh, make them uh, process better, process cheaper, uh, live within their means. And I think that took place under President Obama's tenure as well as it is uh, President Trump. I know that because of the, the worry with the elections, and, and it's a big election year, that my understanding is uh, he and the White House have have tampered down their efforts uh, and, and really are not going to take another look at it until after the election is over, which needs to be the primary focus. But it's a service. The Postal Service is a service, so it's not meant to be a money-making venture, right? That's correct, but at the same time, it can't be a losing proposition at the same time. I mean, they, they do rely on taxpayer dollars, obviously, to function. They're a monumental uh, uh, function of, of, our, of our government and a very expensive one at that. Um, the, the, the Postal Service, obviously, we need, and, and they're under scrutiny, uh, and, and certainly we're worried about the election process. Everybody in, on this panel is worried about the election process and carrying on without a hitch. 
Um, you know, the, the issues with the, the mail that we're seeing now where, where mail is, is slow or not delivering on time or not arriving at all is very concerning to us. Um, and that's obviously why we sit and we look. We, we, we want to make sure that, that everybody's vote is counted, it's received, it's accurate, our election results are accurate, and oh, by the way, our election results are actually counted and reported the night of the election, not weeks later. And so that hinges back on the delivery method. If we're not voting in person and you're voting by mail, we want to make sure the, the mail's running. The way I look at it is this, and, and, and I think about this often, for all of us on this panel and all those that are listening, if we were to win the lottery, I doubt seriously we would mail our winning lottery ticket to claim our prize. We would drive it, right? That's the safest way, in my mind, personally, um, that's the safest way to vote. And so there is concerns about the mail. Obviously, we all are worried about it. We should be. Um, but I, I, I think we're going to get through it. Okay. Ms. Abair, is the possibility of widespread fraud with mail-in ballots a concern to you? I am not concerned about voter fraud. This is an issue that has been incredibly politicized in our society. Uh, people have been voting by mail in a safe and secure manner since the beginning of this country's history. Uh, it's important to note that our armed forces uh, vote by mail and that the president himself actually votes by mail. And uh, members of our society who are 65 and older have been voting by mail safely, securely, without fraud uh, for many, many, many uh, centuries. And so it is important to note, especially during a pandemic, that voting by mail is safe. It does not cause voter fraud. As a matter of fact, I think it was the Brookings Institute that did a report that said uh, being struck by lightning is more likely than voter fraud. And so I think, you know, it's really important for folks to understand that there is not an issue with voter fraud. This was something Sadly, I think that got politicized and it did come from the White House. Uh, any voter fraud commissions that were, um, were, were brought together under the current president were dismantled because there was in fact no uh, evidence of voter fraud. And so this is not really an issue. What we need to do is keep our eyes focused on the prize, which is voting in the election uh, in November. And the way that we do that, as I said, is we get registered to vote that we make a plan to vote and that we cast our ballot. And if we are eligible to vote by mail, that we do that, understanding that it is a safe and secure method of voting. Thank you very much. We've run out of time for this discussion tonight. We'd like to thank our guests, Ms. Abair, Dr. Samuels, Senator Milligan, for their input, as well as all of our other participants. We encourage you to comment on tonight's show on Louisiana Public Square's Facebook and Twitter accounts. Visit lpb.org slash public square and click on the Join the Conversation link. Thanks for watching and have a great night. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org.